Good morning, everyone. Um, today, as you, uh, some of you who are here heard, uh, we are sponsoring a symposium on a trauma-informed uh, response uh, to violence. Uh, we believe that this is critically important to bring together a range of different providers, particularly focused on uh, the 15 areas of our city um, that are experiencing historically and currently uh, the 15 uh, most uh, areas impacted by violence. Um, these providers are on the front lines every single day. So they are working together in collaboration across the city, um, focused on a range of different issues for trauma, substance abuse, addiction, um, and all the other issues that really roll up into uh, the issue um, of violence. And again, looking at and focusing on uh, the root cause of that violence. Um, this symposium is yet another opportunity for us to come together as a city um, and respond to the violence that we're seeing in neighborhoods. Uh, today's symposium uh, will walk our providers um, and partners through harm reduction training, training to administer Narcon and fentanyl strips, uh, introduction to mental health skill building training, um, guided facilitation to co-design innovative service delivery models, and a roadmap uh, for post-event coordination efforts to continue uh, into the summer and through the fall. Um, this is part of the work that we're doing every single day. People often ask, well, what are you doing to get ready for summer? The work regarding violence and violence prevention isn't seasonal, it never ends. And as these providers can attest, they are on the front lines. I'm joined today, <clears throat> of course, by Dr. Allison Arwady, um, who as the Department of Public Health, um, really is the focal point for a lot of the trauma work um, that we're doing um, at the city level and in coordination with our community partners. Um, to her left is Matt Richards, who's the Deputy Commissioner uh, for Behavioral Health, which of course encompasses all of the trauma uh, work from mental health, substance abuse, and addiction. Uh, Matt is also uh, the person who's responsible for uh, alternative um, response uh, models. And it also, I'm joined by Tamara Mahal, who is our senior leader of the uh, uh, Community Safety uh, Coordination Center. Uh, we're happy to take any questions that you have. Let's start with on topic first. Any on topic questions? <laughs> Thanks a lot, Mayor. All right, we'll start off with uh, Marianne Ahern, NBC. Mayor, uh, oh, okay. A uh, couple of questions uh, off topic. Could mm -hmm. you give us your reaction? I don't think we got it yet on Jesse Smollett and whether or not uh, the, the sentence that you felt, whether or not it was fair. Well, <clears throat> I'm hoping that this is the last day that we're going to have to talk about Jesse Smollett. Look, obviously what this young man did in, as the jury found in staging um, a hate crime is offensive. Um, not only did he waste a significant amount of police resources, um, as the court found, not only did he um, bring um, a moment of scrutiny on the city of Chicago that we did not deserve, but also as a um, lesbian myself and as a person of color, we see every single day across the world, across our city, across our state, across our nation, hate crimes being manifest. People are targeted because of who they are or what they are perceived to represent. So for someone to take that um, notion of a hate crime and use it for his own particular purposes, as the court said uh, in his sentencing, is really offensive. And I hope that there will be a moment um, in his life and maybe over the course of the next now 140 plus days that he will have a moment of reflection and regret for what he has done and at some point come to accept responsibility for the crime that he committed, um, but also as a gay man himself, recognizing that the manipulation of public sentiment for his own purposes is one of the worst possible things that you could do. But we're moving on. Our hope is, is that we will get our restitution um, as quickly as possible so that we have bigger, more important things uh, to talk about than Jesse Smollett. Could I also get your reaction to what happened at the Southside Irish Parade yesterday? There have been reports, people have emailed us, that there were racial slurs uh, hurled at you as well as items, and that your security took you away from the parade. No, none of that. I, I didn't experience any of that. Um, and I marched with two different um, unions. I was initially uh, with the Carpenters, and then I finished out uh, the parade with the uh, uh, with the roofers. Um, I didn't hear any racial slurs. There was certainly nothing thrown at me. I, I hope that you're not going to propagate that because no, I didn't experience any of that. I left part of the parade where I was back with the carpenters, took a, um, uh, a little cart 
and moved up to the front of the parade with the roofers. But you didn't that's what. No, I mean, look. People said there were it, items it, thrown, even. No, I didn't. I didn't see any of that. I didn't see any of that, and I certainly didn't experience any of that. Look, the Southside Valley Street Parade, people enjoy themselves and start enjoying themselves sometimes very early. So there were some spirited comments, um, but I certainly didn't experience any of the things that you said, and my security team didn't whisk me away. I went to a di different part of the parade so I could march with another union. Could I ask you for my colleague uh, about the CTU mass, and perhaps Dr. Arwady would weigh in as well. well I, uh, <coughs> CTU filing C the uh, labor action about the mass. Yeah. Could we get your comments on that? Yeah, I mean, it, it, that was expected. Um, but again, because it's active litigation, I won't talk too much about it. I will say, and, and Dr. Hardy obviously can weigh in, because um, we don't do anything with public health in the city without Dr. Hardy and her team um, weighing in. But, you know, we should be grateful that we're at a point two years into the pandemic that we can move to mass optional within CPS. Um, today we're under, again, 1% uh, uh, percent positivity, which is the lowest, I think, that we've been at any point during the pandemic. This is a good news story because of this hard work and sacrifice of so many two years in that stayed home, um, that made the sacrifice to uh, limit their contact with people outside of their, of their home, um, the restaurants and businesses that endured capacity limits, all the things that we did over the course of the last two years focused on keeping people safe and saving lives is bearing fruit in part, obviously, of course, because we've got the life-saving vaccine that's available. So we should be celebrating this moment. We should certainly be remembering and, and reflecting upon the lives that were lost because there were way too many in our city. And I'm fearful um, about the lives that will continue to be lost. We got to encourage people to continue to get vaccinated. But it's a good thing that we're in a place in our city that parents have the option as to whether or not um, their children can wear a mask in school. I would certainly encourage those school communities, and they know um, where they are, and CPS is working with them, where we see lower vaccination rates, that they should really consider continuing wearing masks. But parents now have the option. Dr. Wright, I don't know if you want to comment. Yeah, I would just add that I think people are imagining that masks are entirely gone. They are not entirely gone, just to give you a sense of this. A lot of what has gotten us this far is this layered mitigation. Uh, and there's nowhere like schools that has done more of this in terms of the investments in the ventilation, really thinking about you know, where it's possible to be thinking about who's in contact with each other and limiting some of that, uh, really making sure that when kids are sick, they're staying home, there's access to testing. When I think about the riskiest places in Chicago, schools are actually near the bottom of that list, and we've seen that shown over and over again. And CPS has been looking, as we have throughout the pandemic, at other school systems in Chicago that, of course, had moved to a mask optional even a few weeks ago. We've not seen major problems, as expected, with outbreaks, with surges um, in, for example, the parochial schools uh, or some of the private schools. And can I promise that we're always going to be in such a good place? I can't. A lot depends on variants and continuing to get folks vaccinated. But we will continue to use masks where and when we need to. If, for example, a child is diagnosed with COVID, they need to stay home for five days, and then when they come back, days six through 10, they need to be wearing a mask. If we're investigating a potential cluster, small outbreak, we would likely say we need everybody for a short period here to wear masks while we're using this. And certainly, where kids are having any potential symptoms, they need to get tested for COVID. But we would also, I'd love people just to be thinking a little bit about not spreading my cold germs, my flu germs, you know, even if it isn't COVID. So we are in, honestly, the best place we've been from a COVID perspective. And I believe strongly that when 
we are doing well. It is appropriate to lift some of that. I understand people's anxiety, and again, I encourage people who are concerned to continue to wearing the masks. We've been working with CPS, those KN95 masks, which are good not just for protecting others, but for protecting yourself, remain widely available for adults and children. Um, and CPS is working hard to make sure that children or adults who choose to continue to wear masks with their parents will be supported as well in doing that. And I think it's going to take a few you know, weeks to months, probably, for people to feel more comfortable. And if I had the slightest doubt that taking the masks off in school was going to, in some way, lead to a resurgence of COVID, we wouldn't do it. But I know that that is, not, that is just not the case. Heather Sharon, WDZW. Hi, Mayor. Hi there. Um, the last data we've seen is that 3,000 approximately officers are either unvaccinated or have not told the city whether they're vaccinated. It's less than that, but go ahead. Are you prepared to fire thousands of officers for not being vaccinated? And if you don't, are you concerned that it will be a sign that the city will not enforce it, the rules that it announced several months ago? We will enforce the rules. And my expectation is that the vast majority of police officers who are already vaccinated um, will come into compliance. Um, there's been a lot of misinformation um, out there, so let me take a moment, if you don't mind, to make sure that we're all in one accord. And the police department itself will be putting out a communication to its members um, later this morning uh, because of, there's a lot of misinformation. As you're aware, a few weeks back, an arbitrator uh, ruled that the city was with, within its managerial rights um, to make vaccination a condition of employment. And that's essentially what we've done. We announced it last August, um, gave till October 15th um, for, as a deadline for people to come to compliance. The union has sued us in every potential forum that it can think of and then insisted upon going to mandatory arbitration. We went to arbitration. Our rights were upheld. And what the arbitrator said was, in, in short strokes, is two things. Number one, the first date by which um, uh, members who were taking the two-shot uh, vaccine, they had to get vaccinated by yesterday, uh, March 13th, and then the last shot by April 13th. We're not doing mass firings today, which is what I think a lot of folks um, have been propagating. That's not going to happen. Um, we're looking at the numbers. We, we're starting to see um, last week and over the weekend a uh, number of people going to the portal and reporting that, in fact, they were vaccinated. We continue um, to see that, and I expect to continue seeing that. We're not going to be taking any action against anyone unless they have either in law, uh, ignored a lawful order um, to, and this was really going back to when they needed to register in the portal, uh, refusing to just even give their status. Um, those folks um, are in the process of being disciplined. But my goal always is to educate people into compliance, and my hope is that the vast majority of officers, majority of which are um, vaccinated, will come into compliance and will move on. Uh, last week, Superintendent David <coughs> Brown announced that he would no longer require recruits to the police department to have 60 hours of college credit if they had three years of <coughs> professional experience mm -hmm. in a certain number of um, industries. Mm -hmm. Is that a pro an appropriate change, and was it reviewed by the independent monitoring team in in enforcing the consent decree, and did, that, did the judge endorse that change since the Department of Justice's report was very critical of the city's uh, training standards? and protocols well that didn't need to be endorsed by the judge but of course because we have a good working relationship uh, with the court and the monitor that was uh, previewed for them um, we do think that that was an appropriate thing to do um, as you know um, every city that I'm aware of um, is having challenges during recruiting so we've looked at every single aspect of recruiting from soup to nuts and one of the things that the superintendent and his team recommended is that we um, expand the number of comparable work experience, um, not just limiting it to uh, the military. And that was really as a result of um, that, um, looking at what other um, departments are doing across the country and then coming up with a specific rec recommendation. And of course, it was previewed uh, with a monitor to court. Greg Pratt, Tribune. Uh, good morning, Mayor. Good morning. When it comes to the, the vaccine mandate, so OK, I understand what you said, but um, the, they have to come into compliance by the 13th. Uh, some of them are not, you know, some number, uh, I'll ask your office for the exact number yeah, sure. of, as of today. Um, so 
at what point do people start getting put on no pay status and is that process going to be like in the fall where where there people won't be put on on a no pay status unless they're brought in and told get vaccinated and they say no or is it going to be just a mass thing at some point and what is that point i mean no we we will the department will work on i identifying obviously those officers who we show have not come into compliance they'll be given an opportunity to confirm and verify whether or not the information we have is correct obviously if it's incorrect then we'll make sure we make the uh, proper adjustments if it's correct they'll be given an opportunity um, to comply if they refuse to comply they'll be given an order if they if they still refuse after that then they will be uh, put into a no pay status but that is because of the refusal uh, to comply uh, with a valid direct order um, it'll be similar to but not exactly the same but similar to the process that played out over the course of last fall and how long do you expect that process to be and I'm just making up a number, let's say 2,000 uh, city workers, yeah. whatever the number is. How long do you expect that process to go? Well, are you talking about the police department? Because it's a much, much smaller number yeah, yeah, yeah. across other departments. Just, just um, I don't expect that to be a lengthy process. Uh, it, you know, we need to uh, move on. Um, we've been very clear. It's been upheld by every single court and an arbitrator that has touched this, um, that it is well within our rights um, as the employer uh, to make the vaccine um, as a condition of employment for the obvious reasons. Number one, particularly when it comes to police, we still see the number one cause of death of police officers is COVID-19. Um, so getting vaccinated is important for them, for their family, for their partner, and for uh, the people that they come into contact with on a daily basis. And same thing with other first responders. We do not want a workforce that's going out particularly EMTs administering quasi-medical uh, procedures on folks that are calling 911, those people who are calling should have a right to expect that they are not going to um, be exposed uh, potentially to a life-threatening um, illness because the person who's rendering uh, medical assistance isn't vaccinated. So for a whole host of reasons, and you think about the vast majority of our workforce complied last fall. Um, obviously, police is a little different because they were waiting for um, the final arbitrator ruling. That ruling has now come down. We hope we educate people into compliance. I don't want to see anyone separated from the job, but the rules are the rules and the police have to follow them, as does the fire department, the same as any other city employee. Craig Wally, seven. Well, Mayor, um, with, with the officers in particular, um, we understand that they're going to, you're starting to bring them in, CBD is starting to bring them in this afternoon to do the compliance stuff. Uh, first of all, if you can address that. And, and second of all, do you think most of these officers are vaccinated and just refusing to report it? A lot of them are vaccinated. And, and again, we're starting to see um, that reporting um, happen, but some of them are, are not. Um, and there's a number of them that have filed <clears throat> for uh, one exemption or another, either, or either medical or religious, we'll work our way through that. But again, our hope is that we educate people into compliance. I'll let you talk to the police department about the particulars of when they're gonna start bringing people in and so forth. I'm not involved in that level of detail. And with the uh, unfortunate uh, suicide uh, of a sergeant over the weekend, do you, do you have any, any information that you can share about that? And do you know, did this sergeant apply for a religious exemption and get denied? Look, I, I don't think it's appropriate for me to talk about the particulars related to that um, a particular uh, officer who took his life. Um, I want to make sure that we're respectful, not only of him, but also of his family and survivors and his loved ones. So I'm not going to get into uh, the details of that. I don't think that that's appropriate. John Lewis, WGN. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning. Uh, when it also along the same lines as the vaccine mandate, uh, City Council is looking at at least a small number of the uh, aldermen are looking at calling a special council meeting uh, to look at this mandate. Uh, what do you expect <clears throat> to come of that? Well, look, <clears throat> there are a number of different ways in which aldermen can get information about what's happening regarding COVID, regarding the mandate. What's particularly um, disappointing is that most of the people that signed on to that never took advantage of any of the opportunities that are available to them on a regular basis. For example, not a single one of those um, signatories of that letter reached out to the chairman of the city council's health committee to ask for more information. 
Dr. Rarity just appeared, as she does regularly, before the Health Committee, I think it was on February 28th. Um, there are two members of the people that signed that letter that um, are on the Health Committee. Neither of them asked a single question. And one of them didn't even stay on for the entire meeting. So this is a stunt, as it happened before, but it's unfortunate that it's being done as something so serious about our COVID mitigation efforts. And I categorically reject any suggestion, as the letter says, that somehow our COVID mitigation efforts are impinging upon the quality of life in our city. I mean, just imagine that. Two years into a devastating pandemic where thousands of lives have been lost in our city alone, millions across the world. And we have these folks who are clearly uninformed because most of the information that was in that letter was just categorically incorrect, suggesting that somehow we're doing the wrong thing by urging people to get vaccinated, by doing all the things that we've done over the course of the last two years to keep people safe and healthy. I don't know what world these people live in. And I certainly wouldn't expect that from elected leaders in the city of Chicago, maybe some other place, maybe some other party, but in the city of Chicago, it's really um, discouraging and depressing that these leaders who have multiple avenues to get information at their fingertips through their committee, through calling up the Dr. Artie, calling up Chris Owen, the commissioner of the Department of Human Resources, are calling up the superintendent, fail to avail themselves. So what does that tell you about what's really at stake here? Karen okay. Molina, CBS. Hey there, good morning. Good morning. So with the symposium going on downstairs following mm -hmm. another violent weekend, more than 20 <clears throat> shot and seven in the mass shooting, can you just speak a little bit more to violence prevention in the city and, and your reaction to that mass shooting? <clears throat> Yeah, I think what's important is not to lose sight of the bigger picture. We were down this year in shootings, we're down this year um, in homicides, we're down uh, in carjackings, but violence is a persistent problem that has existed in our city for decades. And the manifestations that we're seeing on a daily basis, in my view, are as a result of us failing to take the opportunity on a systematic basis with our community partners to address the root causes of violence. We're turning that around by the work that Tamara and her team are doing at the CSCC, that Dr. Artie and Matt Richards are doing um, at CDPH, and, and all of us with our community partners to really look at what is driving the violence. The violence is a symptom of poverty. It's a symptom of neglect. It's a symptom of the lack of opportunity and resources at the block level. And if we want to build lasting peace in our city, we've got to address those root causes at the same time that we're dealing with holding the people who are perpetrating the violence in real time accountable. We've got to do both at the same time, but we can't afford any longer in our city to push off to another day the realities of the lives of the children and young people in our city, particularly in those areas um, that are most uh, plagued by violence and have been historically. If we, I, I don't know if you saw the presentation by Pastor Chris Harris, a bright star. They have focused on the area around their church there in Bronzeville and gone out to do a lot of deep work with community partners, looking at the schools, and the results are clear. They're seeing a drop in shootings, in robberies, and the other kind of violent crime. And that's exactly the kind of focus that we are bringing to these 15 most challenged areas um, in our city. So trauma is really the through line through a lot of this. We know from um, studies that have been done that children that grow up in homes that are themselves experiencing violence and trauma um, have a much higher degree of either being victimized or perpetrators of violence themselves. We know that um, the trauma that our young people and really our city was experiencing pre-COVID was exacerbated um, during COVID. We've seen an uptick, and, I, and I'm going to invite Dr. Artie or, or Matt to talk about what we're seeing in the increase in um, overdoses, um, the amount of substance abuse um, that we're seeing those are all, again, manifestations of trauma that we must reckon with 
in order to make sure that our city heals and is ready to move forward, all of us, all of us in every neighborhood. So we've seen, of course, direct impacts of COVID, more than 7,500 deaths in Chicago, but we've also seen a lot of these indirect effects. And where you look at what's been happening with interpersonal violence, not just in Chicago, but across the country, where you look at what's been happening with substance use, opioid overdose, not just here, but across the country. Uh, I think we've seen that with the disruption of a lot of uh, routine safety nets, et cetera, major issues. And so, you know, I can speak with, on, for substance use, for example, CDPH has been working with many of the existing providers um, in some of the areas that are hardest hit every single day collecting in real time where are we seeing overdoses, looking to see uh, where and when are all of the partners not covering those areas, really working from a database perspective to say if there's outreach workers in this area at this time, how are those patients being connected, not just to Narcan and to the harm reduction work, but actually to treatment, because there is evidence-based treatment for substance use, and we feel strongly that it's not just enough to say, oh, opioid overdoses are up, let's work on harm reduction, although that's important. We also think it's critical to bring that harm reduction to the other partners. So downstairs, people who normally work on violence prevention or may work in more traditional mental health are getting training in how to do reversals of opioid overdoses, fentanyl test strips, uh, really wanting to, to br bring this across. But it's about creating structures that don't make people try to get these separate problems addressed and cr instead creating a system that addresses them. But but yeah, I mean, opioid overdoses are the number five cause of the racial life expectancy gap in Chicago, and we see coming out of COVID as much about addressing these other issues as we do COVID itself. Thank you all. Thank you.